Gina is a Google developers expert in web technologies. She's led design systems at Amazon, Salesforce, and Apple, just small companies. Uh, she runs Clarity, a design systems conference, a design systems coalition, and the design systems Slack. She's co-authored the design systems handbook, amongst many other books. And uh, her talk today is all about invisible design systems and how you know design and engineering tools, as they get closer and closer together, uh, will we come to a stage where we don't need those web style guides anymore? Really excited uh, to welcome Gina and welcome Gina. All right, let me just share my screen. I think everyone can see that. Okay, hi, <laughs> I'm Gina. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to start by saying that there is no design system. You might be thinking, wait, what? <laughs> like, why on earth would I say that? Especially when I call myself a design systems advocate. Um, I am being a little tongue in cheek here, and I probably also wanted to have, uh, there is no spoon gift here, <laughs> but I actually do have a point. So bear with me uh, just for a moment. What I'm talking about is design, sy uh, design system as a thing versus design systems as a methodology. During my time at Salesforce, when our team was called design systems and my role was lead designer, comma, design systems, I would get asked a lot, why is it plural? Don't we only have one design system? So I tweeted about this not too long ago and I expanded on it by saying that a design system or the design system makes people think of a deliverable artifact or like a library, um, UI library. But it's ongoing design systems work, like process improvement and workflows. So lately, I've been thinking a lot about the way we talk about design systems, including the confusion and negativity that can come along with it. Amelie Lamont gave a talk in 2018 called The Language of Design. And in it, she talked about the way that we talk about design systems, as well as design itself, uh, from a jargony point of view. And she argues that design is technically problem solving. I definitely agree. And people get caught up in design as the actual role or action of designing and have even taken issue with the term design systems for this very reason. And have even suggested that it should be called code systems or UI systems. Um, I don't actually think it does us a good service to just swap out one role for the other. And at the end of the day, is it even about a role? So for other folks, which I include myself, we see design as a larger effort that involves the end user experience, which includes usability, accessibility, performance, um, et cetera, as well as having a huge impact on the business. And this includes code. But really it should all be focused about people. I like Mina Markham's definition of what makes a good art directed design system. And she says that art direction is progressive, localized, cross-functional, inclusive, and systematic. So you'll notice that the emphasis of what she speaks about is on people. So in the design systems work that we do, you might think of a style guide or a component library or a sketch UI kit. And there are arguments on whether these things can be considered design systems or not, you know, maybe if it includes this thing or that other thing. And we even talk about whether design systems are a product or more like a service. And you know, our ideas around this do evolve and change. Back in 2017, I tweeted the silly tweet about updating UI when you don't have a design system. So you can see even I called things a design system. Um, I certainly don't mean for this to sound like some rule that's being broken. It's just a fun thought that hopefully you'll find interesting in the way uh, we move forward with design systems work. So my take is the word design and system used in combination together literally just means to systemize your design. And in my worldview, that is about the overall experience. It's problem solving. And so if for you that does mean a sketch UI kit, then you do you, boo. <laughs> my point is, I think there's too much focus on the deliverables in the first place. 
Uh, what has me really excited about building websites is largely around design systems and the design tools that we use to build them. Though, you know, design systems aren't um, certainly limited, they're not limited to websites. So in the ever so hot right now world of design systems, one of the most common phrases that people use is bridging the gap between designers and developers. And this was on several resumes that I reviewed during my time at Salesforce uh, when we were hiring for the Lightning Design System team. And it is a fair endeavor to strive for as we want to bring alignment, coherence, and unity to product design and engineering, all with the goal of having a quality consistent experience for the, same, uh, for the people using our products and services. However, bridging the gap still implies that there is a gap. Why is that gap there in the first place? Is it due to years of legacy process and workflows that still seep into our day-to-day -day work? I mean, I could see legacy being a real world scenario need to work through, but what about the newer and smaller startups? Why do they have a gap too? So as a design systems practitioner, advocate, enthusiast, whatever you wanna call me, <laughs> um, I always am seeking ways to improve the people side of our work, how we meet and communicate, how we prioritize our roadmap, uh, how we iterate on our process and way of working. However, another piece of this is the tools that we use. And some of our tools have come a long, long way. And it certainly seems like a new one is popping up almost every day. Um, but the ones that get me really excited are the ones where I see them do more than bridging the gap. A while back, modules arrived at the scene as a visual code editor that enables you to design, document, and deploy your design system without writing code. And I noticed they used the hashtag, close the gap. I could not help but love that. I'm very keen to see our design tools move away from simply bridging gaps and more towards closing them, getting rid of them altogether. So for example, a feature I see of bridging the gap is developer handoff, which usually um, in most cases that I've seen, though not everybody, in most cases, this is where pixel dimensions are spec'd out and hex codes are delivered as a spec. In my experience, and what I've seen time and time again, is that delivering specs like this can promote duplication in code, inconsistencies, and are prone to error. And an example of closing the gap, however, are tools that work with actual real quality code instead of vector boxes. So some tools achieve this by exposing design tokens. And you can see this in tools like Envision DSM, which have tokens built in. Another tool, uh, Diaz, is an open source developer toolkit uh, using tokens to turn your design language into scalable code. And there are other tools, like I mentioned mo uh, modules earlier, also Interplay. Um, there's a lot more that are popping up all the time. And they, when they work with coded components, but in a visual way, I find those very interesting. This is way, way better than the WYSIWYG editors of the past because the generated code is actually um, aimed at being accessible and production quality. And that's not to leave out the other design tools like Adobe XD, Figma, Framer, Sketch, UXPen, and many, many, many more that are doing a lot in this space to move the process forward. Design tools are bringing in smarter, automated ways to check for color contrast and other accessibility issues that can be detected early on. Uh, Sketch had recently announced their assistant feature, which was planned for this year. I think it still is. Um, and it checks for visual design discrepancies. And some design tools are using real code, as I mentioned, in the product or in your product. And it's not just design tools, engineering tools are advancing every day as well. I was attending Flutter Interact recently, which was an event held by Google, uh, targeting their, their Flutter UI toolkit community. And it previously enabled you to get apps built for native platforms like Android and iOS from one code base. But now it also has support for desktop and web. 
And the push at this year or last year's event, new it's a new decade, Gina. <laughs> the push at the, the event was it, to make it approachable for creatives with integrations for, with tools like Adobe XD. And it really does feel to me that design and engineering tools are coming closer and closer together. And I think that's really cool and exciting. With the rise of visual development, there's also the no code movement. While not new is, is growing in popularity quite rapidly. So you can build full featured websites using Webflow, Squarespace, Wix, uh, visual declarative app building has been explored for years at larger tech giants like Salesforce uh, with their lightning app builder to smaller companies like Glide that let you generate an entire app from a spreadsheet. And then with task-based automation services such as Zapier, if this then that, there's so much you can do without writing code at all. But don't get me wrong. I love writing code and I love seeing other people code, especially designers. And I love working with engineers. I am not saying that we should not code. That is not what I'm saying here. But what I am excited to see is us to move away from the slower throw designs over a wall process. And I want to see people able to make things without the requirement to code. And it'll be also really nice to get away from the tired argument on whether designers should code. And we can all move towards talking about what can we create together. This was an app I built in just a couple hours uh, for my conference, Clarity, and I used a spreadsheet. This is using Glide, which I mentioned earlier. And this like blew my mind that I could throw an app together um, with no code just by uh, filling, picking the components I needed and throwing the data in. Oops, actually, I had something else I wanted to say on that. Oh, oh well. Um, basically, that's the kind of world I want to be in is where we can build things more quickly. So this is something I'm striving for in 2020, this new decade that we're in. Uh, what ways can we improve our collaboration, remove any proverbial gaps between design and engineering and not just bridge them? and have more meaningful conversations around the work that we do. I don't have any wrong or right answers here, but I am looking forward to seeing this progress in our field. However, I have to tell you, um, a lot of the time that I'm working on design systems, I'm not even touching a design tool or a coding tool. I'm not even um, maybe like creating components in any sort of way. A lot of times it's people focused work. I'm reviewing, I'm advising, I'm organizing, I'm coordinating, I'm triaging, I'm educating, I'm supporting. And that's a lot of invisible systems work right there. I use invisible to mean that it's not like a direct tangible object in some of this work. And even though it does serve the end user uh, through the product that um, comes out of that. Amelie Lamont said in her language of design talk that designed objects are the fruit of invisible systems. And Kim Williams spoke recently in a talk she gave uh, called Start With Your Brand Purpose on what she called design systems love. And she said, we support everyone through change. Internally, change is so hard. How do you really, really build those relationships up through empathy? The onus is on us to educate, to facilitate, to help others understand, to speak the language, to be that bridge, to be the connector, to be the catalyst for our companies. I really, really loved that. And so, while I think it's fun to explore new tools and get really excited about certain processes, at the end of the day, in my most humble opinion, the best design system teams are not just hybrid teams. They are also teams that work and support each other really well, uh, thus producing amazing user-centered work. 
I think a shining example of this uh, is the Spotify Encore team. Um, I had the opportunity to see a talk at Design Systems London, and they published a post on Encore recently. And they said that what makes Encore different is that it's not a single monolithic design system. It's a framework that brings Spotify's existing design systems under one brand, a system of systems. So the design systems work is not just about the style guide website and instead focuses on the needs across several systems that are connected. Design tokens help this to be a reality and needless to say, I'm a big fan. I also like to talk about community because I love the design systems community, um, but also think about the community within your organization. Nathan Curtis has a guiding principle for the design systems work that he does. And he said, favor community over control. When you're doing design systems work, you are actually building a community. And this can be around shared language, uh, nomenclature, an alliance purpose, and better closer collaboration. It doesn't have to be a style police situation. I actually very much dislike the word governance. This can be a joint effort, uh, working together to share the ownership of design systems together. I was a huge fan of the pairing model that we had at Salesforce when I was there. The work that we did in design systems informed the work of the product designers but the work that the product designers did informed the work that we did in design systems. So it was a very cyclical model and combined Nathan Curtis's observed models of the centralized team and the federated contributors. Um, from my experience, I have found that great design system teams have hybrid skill sets, whether that's having actual hybrid people like designers slash engineers on the team or just ensuring that those skill sets are represented across the team. And it's important to have perspectives from design, engineering, product, content, accessibility, and more. Uh, Dan Mall said uh, recently, I think that part of a designer's role, and not even a designer, anybody who uses the design system by nature of what a design system is, it's the conglomeration of all the disciplines, some code, some design, some product knowledge, some writing. And what that means is I think everyone on the team has to approach it with some humility. So to be clear, when I talk about designs, invisible design systems, I'm not saying don't build a style guide or don't build a sketch UI kit, use whatever works best for your organization. But I do think people spend way too much time sometimes on those artifacts and um, not enough time in the other areas that I've been talking about. So this is a plea to focus on the people using your products and to think about design systems as more of a methodology. So my suggestion for this new decade that we're in is to perhaps move away from thinking of design system um, as a thing, an actual thing, especially when it comes to the negative perception of, oh, you're spending way too much time making style guide websites or UI kits, um, but more of a way of working better and more efficiently and more creatively so that we can build great experiences for our users. I like to repeat in my work, design systems are for people because it is a call to cherish, support, and empower the people you serve, both internally and externally. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> I might have gone a lot quicker than I expected. <laughs> no, that was that was really really amazing. Love the whole the underlying theme of uh, you know impact over artifacts. Uh, mm -hmm. Really amazing. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. It was really great having you. Thank you so much.